Good morning. My name is Rebecca, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to Kiera Corp's first quarter 2021 conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Thank you. I would now like to turn the call over to Dan Cuthbertson. You may begin. Thank you, and good morning. Joining me today will be Dean Setaguchi, President and CEO, Eileen Marikar, Senior Vice President and CFO, Jamie Urquhart, Senior Vice President and Chief Commercial Officer, and Bradley Locke, Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer. We will begin with some prepared remarks, after which we will open the call to questions. I would like to remind listeners that some of the comments and answers that we will provide speak to future events. These forward-looking statements, and given as of today's date, and reflect events or outcomes that management currently expects. In addition, we will refer to some non-GAAP financial measures. For additional information on non-GAAP measures and forward-looking statements, refer to Kiara's public filing available on CDAR and on our website. With that, I'll now turn the call over to Dean. Thanks, Dan, and good morning, everyone. I'd first like to take a moment to acknowledge frontline workers and those working to administer vaccines in the fight against COVID. We appreciate your efforts and dedication. I would also like to acknowledge our employees, many still working remotely, for their commitment to safety and their continued efforts to keep our assets running safely and reliably for our customers. At Kiera, our top priority continues to be the health and safety of our people and the communities in which we operate. About this time last year, global energy markets faced significant uncertainty. I'm pleased to share that Kiera remained resilient, and in this last quarter, we've seen encouraging signs of recovery. That's reflected in strong performance across all three segments of our integrated business, and in our first quarter financial results. Volumes in our gathering processing business increased by 7% compared to the last quarter, including 5% growth in our South region, leading to strong financial performance from the segment. This result represents a year of hard work and close collaboration with our customers, which aligns with our goal of being number one in customer recognition. Our liquid infrastructure segment delivered record results for the quarter, resulting from continued high demand for, for all services, including strong deliveries from our industry-leading condensate system. Our liquid segment provides essential services to a wide range of customers throughout the basin and continues to deliver the best returns in our portfolio with stable contracted cash flow. These attributes will remain our focus for future growth capital, which includes a CAPS pipeline project. We also had solid performance from our marketing segment, supported by strong pricing across the commodities we service. Yesterday, we announced a significant increase to our 2021 guidance for this segment, which Jamie will speak to shortly. We're pleased to deliver these first quarter results, but we also continue to focus on our goal of delivering superior shareholder returns over the long term. And that means we must continue to maintain our strong financial position, keep improving our safety and reliability, deliver in our efforts to maximize efficiency, and prepare for energy transition. A strong balance sheet and financial discipline have long been the hallmarks of our business. Our conservative approach again, has again served us well through this last commodity price downturn. Today, our balance sheet remains in good shape with low leverage and ample capacity to fund our CAP pipeline project. We continue to take steps towards improving our safety and reliability performance. We recognize the importance of both factors in delivering superior customer recognition and total shareholder returns, and we continue to hold ourselves accountable. We continue, to, we continue our pursuits of being the most efficient operator for our customers and growing margins through efficiency gains and reducing costs. Our customers rely on our infrastructure assets as well as our commercial, operational, and logistics expertise. This allows them to get their products to the highest value markets. We also see opportunities to apply technology 
and innovation to improve safety, reliability, and lower emissions. We recognize the world is undergoing a transition towards a low carbon future. Investor support and government policy are further enabling this transition. We believe the Canadian energy industry has an advantage in its ability to continue to responsibly deliver the energy the world needs. At Kiera, we want to be part of the solution and view this transition as an opportunity. Later this year, we will set emissions targets that will consider a wide range of efforts that we have underway. To close on a more general note, the Canadian energy industry is also showing some positive signs that point to recovery. For the first time in many years, pipeline export capacity for both oil and natural gas will soon be adequate to meet industry needs. And with growing local demand from the petrochemical industry and better connections to overseas markets, the trends for natural gas liquids such as propane also look encouraging. In addition, recent consolidation amongst, amongst producers are also good for our industry as it creates stronger players who are better positioned for the long term. I'll now turn it over to Jamie to provide an update on our commercial activities. Thanks, Dean, and good morning. As Dean mentioned, we have increased our 2021 marketing segment guidance. The higher guidance is based on year-to-date performance, a disciplined hedging program, and follows the conclusion of successful negotiations for natural gas liquid supply agreements for the contract year beginning April 1st and ending in March 2022. As a result, we have raised our 2021 realized margin guidance for the marketing segment to between $260 and $290 million. This replaces our previous guidance range of between $180 and $220 million. The marketing segment continues to contribute to enhance our overall corporate returns and provides funding for investments in more highly contracted infrastructure assets. I'll now take a moment to provide some broader context for our return expectations on CAPS. CAPS is transformative for Kiera. The project is highly desired by industry and it provides a link in our value chain that fully integrates our business. It, pro- it brings a much needed alternative transportation solution for condensate and natural gas liquids from the Montney and Duvernay plays in Northwest Alberta to Kiera's liquids hub in Fort Saskatchewan. The initial capacity remains 70% contracted under long-term transportation agreements with an average term of 14 years. Based on our engagement with new and existing customers and the expected ramp up in industry activity, we remain confident that we'll be able to secure the additional contracted volumes to meet our return expectations of 10 to 15% by 2025. A reminder that this return is for the project on a standalone basis. I'll now turn it over to Brad to provide an update on how preparations are going for the, the CAPS project and also speak to other operational highlights. Thanks, Jamie. I'm pleased to share that during the quarter, we've made significant progress on the CAPS project in preparation for mainline construction kickoff this summer. In Q1, we completed clearing almost 150 kilometers of pipeline right away, and pipe fabrication is well underway. The project is a great Made in Alberta story. The clearing work involved five local indigenous owned and affiliated contractors who delivered outstanding performance and pipe fabrication is currently being done in Camrose, Alberta. At the Wild Horse Crude Oil Storage and Blending Terminal in Cushing, Oklahoma, mechanical completion was declared on January 29th, and commissioning activities are underway. Our operations team continues to make steady progress, and we expect that the facility will be fully operational this summer. At Wapiti, there's been a lot of great work done by the team. We've had strong safety and reliability performance so far this year, and we continue to grow facility volumes. In the third quarter, we'll have a short planned outage to further ensure the future long-term reliability of this asset. We also have scheduled 10-day turnarounds at Zeta Creek in June and the Brazil River Gas Plant, which is currently underway. I'll now turn it over to Eileen, who will run through our financial results. Thanks, Brad. Here delivered solid first quarter financial results with strong performance from each business segment. Adjusted EBITDA for the first quarter of 2021 was $225 million, while distributable cash flow was $165 million. Net earnings worth $86 million. 
The gathering and processing segment delivered margin of $79 million as we reached new throughput highs at both the Wapiti and Pipestone gas plants. We delivered a record $105 million of realized margin in our liquid infrastructure business. This performance can be attributed to the continued high demand for all services, including increased storage activity and strong delivery from our compensation. And our marketing segment delivered a realized margin of $61 million. We can continue to maintain a solid financial position. We ended the first quarter with a net debt to adjusted EBITDA ratio of 2.7 times. This is within our conservative target range of two and a half to three times on a covenant basis. The company has $1.5 billion in available liquidity with minimal near-term debt maturity. In addition, we completed a $350 million hybrid note offering in March. This positions us well to fund our 2021 growth capital program of between $400 and $450 million. The majority of this growth capital will be directed toward the construction of the CAP pipeline project in the second half of the year. With that, I'll hand it over to Dean for some closing comments. Thanks, Eileen. CARES value proposition continues to be the delivery of a sustainable dividend underpinned by low debt leverage and a deep inventory of investment opportunities aimed at expanding distrib- distributable cash flow per share. Looking ahead, CARE will continue to be a safe, reliable, and sustainable operator dedicated to serving our customers and generating value for our shareholders. We're excited about the future and we're confident we have the culture people, and assets for continued success. On behalf of CARES Board of Directors and our management team, I thank our employees, customers, shareholders, and other stakeholders for their continued support. With that, I'll turn it back to our operator for Q&A. At this time, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. And your first question comes from Rob Hope with Scotiabank. Yep. Good morning, everyone. Um, first question is on CAPS. Uh, just given the improving commodity price environment as well as some of the other dynamics that we're seeing in the basin, um, you know, have have discussions for additional contracting capacity uh, accelerated there? Uh, and then as well, are you seeing incremental, incre- incremental interest from producers in Northeast BC with uh, some uh, potential to get Northeast BC volumes down into Alberta there as well? Maybe I'll just answer your second question first. I mean, the, um, the announcements and the notification that was uh, filed by North River Midstream, um, it's an independent system. That's um, a, a BC system. Ours is an independent system, which is in Canada. Both systems are open access. So we, we like the, the whole concept of um, more competition in our basin. It's, it's just good overall. And um, so we're happy to see that... Uh, that project continued to develop. Um, certainly with more volumes uh, being collected in BC, obviously that the, the potential for us being able to capture some of that volume in caps is uh, is more promising. But again, um, it's still early days. And maybe on the contracting front, you can touch on that, Jim. Yeah, so uh, certainly as, as we've um, finalized and confirmed our, our commitment to CAPS and as we shared, um, you know, starting to clear trees, um, you know, manufacturing pipe, you know, that, that in our customers' eyes has, has made the project, um, you know, solidified as a real project. So certainly we've, we've had more meaningful conversations with respect to incremental volumes. Um, would, would just temper people's expectations though around timing of when we might be in a, in a position to, um, you know, make further announcements around additional contracting is most customers will really do want to see line of sight as to when that project's going to be complete. And, you know, we, we hope and we will continue to keep our customers um, apprised of, of the development of that project um, to remind everybody that that project is scheduled to be complete Q1 2023. Um, you know, we certainly expect that's going to be the case. Um, but, you know, to, to re- reconfirm, um, yeah, much, m- much more conversation happening with our customers, more meaningful conversation, uh, particularly at the top end of, of, our, our, of our pipeline up in the Pipestone area. Yeah, Rob, I mean, just, you know, overall, I was 
see we've seen some pretty robust results from our, our producers uh, in this basin. And, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the projections are that their balance sheets are going to be pretty healthy here in another quarter or two. So, you know, it's just a lot of a lot more discussion about future drilling plans and, and growth. And uh, obviously that only, um, you know, makes it more encouraging for uh, our, uh, our capital pipeline and the rest of our business. Excellent. All right. And that leads me to kind of my next question. Uh, you know, taking a look at the northern plants, you know, good to see the volumes ticking up there. Uh, how are volumes tracking to take or pays? And, you know, at, at what point do you start having discussions about, uh, you know, uh, the incremental capacity at WAP be, be coming available? Yeah, overall, I mean, we've always said that that, that, that fairway in the money is, um, you know, if not the most economic, it's certainly top tier uh, within the, the Montney. And, um, you know, we're actually surprised at how quickly uh, drilling activity has responded um, based on our sort of some of the communications we had with our producers just in the fall. So um, we think that's very healthy. But again, you know, if this commodity price environment uh, remains, which we, we feel you know, pretty good about, um, we think that's only going to increase in the fall. So there's some there's some producers in the area that uh, aren't even delivering to us that are now you know much more engaged about um, you know the potential of you know re reactivating drilling plans and um, potentially deliver delivering to our our gas plants. So you know again that's very positive and and again we've always said we we're in the best stretch of the the money and, and we should be able to capture more volumes over time. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is just that there there are some new players. Um, in the Wapiti area that have, have made some acquisitions, um, you know, in the car Wapiti area that we are very familiar with in other parts of our business. So um, we're, we're, we're upbeat, obviously, with respect to the Wapiti gas plant. Thank you. Your next Thanks. question comes from the line of Linda as Orgelis with TD Securities. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on your experiences uh, over the past year with respect to leveraging technology and um, transforming your some of your business processes that way. Um, you know, clearly um, many of us have accelerated our use of technology in many ways during a pandemic. And I'm, I'm wondering uh, what practices uh, you might uh, keep as permanent and further evolve the business to realize efficiencies and opportunities beyond what you currently have in your uh, plan? You know, maybe I'll, I'll start with, <laughs> first of all, good morning, Linda. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, the pandemic, there are some benefits that came from that in terms of just us understanding what we could do remotely. And we've operated our, our business very well, uh, especially last year through very, very challenging conditions. And, uh, I, you know, I credit our, our technology team for enabling us to do that. So as we look forward, you know, we're really thinking about how do we, how do we leverage off of that in the future? And so, you know, we will have some uh, more flexible sort of work, work uh, environment. Uh, we, we do like to collaborate still together. So. We'll make sure that you know we, we continue to do that on some basis, but we will add some more flexibility. But overall, as a company, we think that um, technology and innovation is, um, is something that's a, a big opportunity for our company and something that we want to leverage in a, in a much bigger way in the future. So maybe with that, I can just maybe pass it over to Jamie or Brad, and you can maybe talk about some things in your areas of, that, that you're looking at. Uh, hi, Linda. Uh, I think, you know, certainly from a from an operations side, um, you know, utilizing data management and and, uh, and data access to more centralize some of our uh, operations and business processes is something that we're we're spending a lot more time and energy on right now. Um, and I think over the long term, that has a real opportunity to reduce our operating costs and ultimately provide more value add services to our uh, to our customers on that line. So. Yeah, so on the commercial side, Linda, you know, I, we've got a couple projects that, that were in the uh, the latter stages of implementing with respect to using some machine learning to allow our people to make better business decisions. Um, you know, we, we deal with a lot of data and, and asking people to be able to process that data and, 
make the best business decisions possible. They they do a great job, um, but uh, you know, using machine learning um, and artificial intelligence just allows our people to um, you know to make better business decisions. And so we've got some applications as it pertains primarily to our commercial marketing team that we're that we're we're implementing, and we've seen some positive results uh, out of that so far. Yeah, maybe and just maybe last, lastly, uh, Linda. You know, I think from a safety perspective, I think that again the, uh, the technology we've been using just to uh, communicate virtually um, has been very effective. So, especially in the the cold winter months here in Alberta, um, you know, I think it's a, a big benefit if we don't have as many people on the road and we can we can do things virtually um, and for the safety of our people. Thank you. Uh, and on a separate note. Um, you know, another trend that we're seeing is inflationary pressures on many fronts. And I'm wondering how you can comment on whether you're starting to see that in your operating or capital expenses, and if you can specifically comment on what percentage of your uh, costs uh, for caps have been locked down, uh, uh, both in terms of what's incurred to date, but as well as uh, more importantly, prospectively, and also confirm uh, that there's no uh, scope change contemplated for caps at this point. So, uh, from, a, from an operating cost perspective, I think it is fair to see that we're seeing some inflationary pressure. Certainly, you know, um, power is one of those components. I think we do have, like all of our other commodities, we do have, we do actively manage our power price and, and hedge that out over time to take to mitigate some of the impact of that. So, uh, so that's a benefit to us. Um, you know, certainly other commodities like steel and copper and, and some raw materials are seeing inflationary pressures as well. Um, we're fortunate with, uh, you know, with caps, the, the fact that the, we had a one-year delay allowed us to really lock in some of those opportunities early on. So we had ordered our pipe, um, you know, over a year ago. Um, and uh, and secure that under a contract. Now it doesn't that doesn't take all the inflationary pressure out of there, but it takes a lot of it out. So um, so that's been real positive for us. On caps, you know, we've locked down our pipe, we've locked down our mainline contractors, we've locked down another a number of key services as well. Um, so I don't have an exact number, but it's going to be well north of 50% of our costs are are already locked in. Um, for that project, so we're feeling pretty good about our our confidence in in delivering that within the the budget that we've contemplated. And may I ask what contingency you've got embedded in that uh, uh, budget? Um, yeah, we don't usually disclose that, um, but certainly you know we use good project management principles to to assess contingency on the basis of um, thoroughness of engineering to date. Thank you. It was worth uh, asking. Maybe um, on a separate note, um, your presence in the U.S. Uh, has expanded with Wild Horse. Uh, it will be operational soon. Has your expectation for the facility changed since it was originally contemplated, given that you know we're going through a pandemic, there was the unfortunate winter storm URI, and, and maybe there's some changes in, in some of the market dynamics there as a result, among other considerations. Can you comment on I guess how Wild Horse fits into your approach to the U.S. and, and what, how it might have evolved. Yeah, Linda, thanks for the question. Uh, nothing's changed um, as a result of the business thesis of Wild Horse. We're still very encouraged and excited about getting that that facility up and running and and being part of our vertically integrated um, you know value chain and and enabling us to find highest value markets for for the the products that that we do market on behalf of our our customers. Um, you know, in, in particular, you know, our U.S. assets, um, Wild Horse will be very integrated with our o OLT asset that's been, um, we're being very pleased with since we, we uh, started owning that asset. Um, um, and so, yeah, no, we're, we're, there's no, no change as a result of uh, any, anything that's happened um, over the last 12 months. Thank you. I'll jump back in the queue. Your next question comes from the line of Matt Taylor with Tudor Pickering Hold Co. Yeah, thanks for taking my questions here. Uh, I wanted to first start on on your run rate marketing guidance. We've now seen three consecutive years of guidance revised higher, with a major reason being those low butane costs. 
So can you talk about those assumptions? Uh, do you think they're still relevant or do you think the run rate level is actually higher? Yeah, well, we, we will be likely at the end of the year, um, you know, looking to revise that, that base guidance. Matt, I think, well, I know one of the reasons why we're hesitating to do that is just to get a better line of sight with respect to the contributions that both Colina Park and Wild Horse will make to, uh, to our marketing business, but also it's a significant contributor to our, our liquids infrastructure side of our business as well. Um, and as it pertains to butane, um, you know, the, the contracting year that we just completed, uh, you know, a successful contracting year, but, um, you know, butane prices um, in, within North America, you know, we, we look at it, they're, they're, they're still dynamic with respect to uh, the demand of butane within Western Canada relative to the supply. So, uh, you know, th those things do play into ultimately how marketing is going to perform going forward, specifically as it pertains to AEF. Um, so, you know, we're, we're obviously looking to um, have the ability to stabilize um, the marketing contributions as much as possible, but just recognizing that, you know, butane um, pricing is still dynamic and, and fluctuates year to year. That's great, Jamie. Thanks for those comments there. And then um, I wanted to address, you mentioned a, a standalone comment on your CAPS returns project's expectation. So I just wanted to clarify that. So the opportunity to source volumes from this other open access pipeline is not considered in your return guidance. And then, and then maybe more broadly, does this give you an opportunity to pull forward your assumption of earning that return by, you know, two years after in-service? Well, our return expectations are based on um, our forecast with respect to bringing pipe um, volumes into that pipeline. And when we say returns on a standalone basis, it's just looking at, you know, that pipeline, that investment that we've announced. Um, obviously, there would be um, upstream benefits uh, potentially with respect to some of our gathering and processing assets. Um, that would feed into that pipeline or some of our downstream assets that ultimately that pipeline will feed into. And that's the, that's what we're referencing when we say standalone. Was that your question, Matt? Yeah, and then just to extend a bit further. So then, yeah, if you're looking at your own system and integration on the value chain side, if there's if there's more volumes from a separate from a separate system coming in, obviously that's not considered. And, and so there might be some you know, wiggle room and, and moving within that range. Is that the right way to be thinking about that? I, I guess that when, when we, um, I think we've always been sort of open to say that we have a base level of contracting, 70% of initial capacity. And, um, you know, to get to our 10 to 15% herbal rate, we still need to secure more volumes. And, you know, we have a number of different ways that we can do that. We can, we can capture a larger market share um, you know, our, we, we, uh, we're talking to more, uh, you know, producers are on the Alberta side of the border about additional volume uh, that we, we hope to contract as well. And also there's a the potential for BC volumes. So we're not specifying exactly where it comes from, but we think on a risk basis um, through those three sort of sources that we're going to get to that 10 to 15 percent threshold. That's great. Thanks for that, Dean. And one last one, if I may, we saw an announcement by a competitor this morning on a new NGL system. Does that, uh, any thoughts there on, on how this may impact your, your pet chem feedstock strategy or, or any downstream conversations you're having on new frac capacity or just even more broadly, you know, what this means in terms of the Alberta pet chem strategy, um, you know, just generally? I, I think more more supplies of uh, NGLs and feedstock are good for our basin, and uh, you know we we know the people at uh, I'm presuming you're referring to Wolf Midstream. Um, we know them very well, and you know if there's any opportunities for us to work together to increase enhance the efficiency of um, you know NGL extraction and delivery, um, you know we're happy to work with them. But overall, it's good for our basin and. It's, the competition is what attracts um, more business to our province, which is what we want. Yeah, Matt, and I think you're aware that those those are um, incremental volumes that will be straddled off of uh, off of the natural gas system. So we we don't view those as being uh, competition with respect to our 
our designs to uh, potentially expand KFS in the future. Yeah, I, I was referring to uh, comp competition in the sense of um, competing sources of feedstock for for okay, uh, yeah. at players. Yeah, no, yeah, no fair point. Yeah, thanks, guys. I was I was also referencing the fact that they're looking to build out a, a frack as well. Um, yeah, so yeah, thanks for addressing that question there. I'll jump back in the queue. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Your next question comes from the line of Chris Tillett with Barclays. Hey guys, good morning. Um, I guess the first question, just to sort of follow up um, on, on something Matt was asking, um, given the the uh, you know return of activity that that we're seeing in the basin today, um, does it make sense at this point in time to sort of contemplate maybe expanding? Caps further west out of Gordondale um, into you know into Northeast BC is is that you know something you guys are actively investigating? Do you think maybe that's something that would make sense to do further down the road? Uh, just curious to hear kind of where your heads are are at on that at the moment. Well, our cap system is an Alberta only based NGL solution transportation solution, so. Um, if there's demand to build it to the border, whether it's um, you know the producers that are up in the Gordale area, or whether there's a, a pipeline system in BC that wants to connect to our system, um, it has to be underpinned by contracts to justify the incremental capital. So, um, do we think there's potential for that? Um, absolutely, but we will not make investments unless we have um, adequate financial support for it. Um, understood. Okay. Uh, the rest of my questions have been asked. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Your next question comes from the line of Patrick Kinney with National Bank Financial. Yeah, good morning. Uh, just on the Colonial Pipeline outage here and the impact we're seeing on RBOB, any comment on how this situation is playing into your spot iso-octane margins? And I guess maybe just to confirm if this short-term tailwind, for Q2 at least, is uh, baked into your new marketing guidance range for the year. Yeah, Pat, it's Jamie. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, it's, it's you know as you're aware, you know our Bob popped a little bit over the weekend, and it's it settled primarily. I know it popped again a little bit this morning, and we expect there's going to be some volatility in the short term. It really will be determined on on the extent of of that that outage. Um, um, you know. I think it's fair to say that those that can take advantage of optionality tend to benefit from this type of disruption. And, and uh, you know, we, we build our business off of the ability to lock in stable cash flows, but also um, be able to take advantage of optionality um, when, and when it presents itself. So hopefully that answers your question. It does. Thanks, Jamie. And then uh, maybe just looking out more on a sustainable basis for the iso-octane business. Perhaps you can just walk us through some of the opportunities around clean fuel standards and what this emerging demand trend could mean for your you know, realized premium going forward relative to historical. Yeah, sure, happy to. Um, yeah, certainly we're, we're looking at the clean fuel standard at, at AEF and, and the opportunities that it does present to us um, particularly around um, some potential efficiencies at that site to get our intensity, our carbon intensity down at that facility. Um, so a little early days on that, um, but we certainly see um, once again an opportunity um, at AEF with respect to that clean fuel standard. Um, you know, part of that clean fuel standard, and, and we we look at this, and I think we've telegraphed this um, to to the market, is that we we are focused on trying to um, find higher value markets within North America. Traditionally, we've sent a lot of product down to the Gulf of Mexico and sold it out of there where we've, we've realized higher margins, frankly, if we can find um, you know, uh, sales points within North America, both from a rail cost perspective, but also just frankly from a realized premium perspective. So that's going to be a continued focus for us. We've actually hired a, a, an individual that's dedicated um, to AEF and increasing margins out of that facility. Um, so it, it's obviously really important to us. Um, on, a, on a margins perspective, we're, we're still seeing, we're not, we're not back to sort of the levels we were pre 
COVID with respect to the octane premium component of, of pricing of, of our ISO octane. Certainly crude and on RBOB are at, you know, at historic highs, certainly on the RBOB side. Um, but the premiums still are, they're, they're, they're decent, but they're not back to those levels. And frankly, our view is that they're not going to get back to um, the historic levels until um, um, octane worldwide gets more balanced. We're still seeing a lot of octanes coming from the rest of the world into North America because octanes are priced off of RBOB, and RBOB is very, very strong in North America right now. Um, but until we see demand for gasoline in the rest of the world catch up to the production capabilities of the rest of the world, you know, we're going to we're going to continue to see octanes being pushed into North America and keep those premiums at the current levels. So, um, you know, we expect that's going to happen, probably going to ex uh, um, happen over the next, um, you know, period of time as the vaccines take hold and, and we see that, that global demand get back to normal levels. Hopefully that helps give some flavor to how we see our ISO octane business. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's great color. Um, last one for me, I guess for Eileen, um, wondering if there could be a credit rating update here on the horizon with S&P, just given I believe the downgrade last year was largely related to the lower commodity prices at that time, which of course, you know, we're now back to pre-pandemic levels. Not sure, um, uh, you know, and I guess they would also view the recent hybrid issue as being positive to your credit ratio. So just curious on the potential timing for uh, a rating review. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Um, their S&P is actually currently undergoing their annual review, and, and based on our discussion so far, everything is significantly more positive, certainly, than it was a year ago, especially as we showed, you know, 2020 results um, much stronger than, than they always tend to forecast. Um, overall, we don't expect any any significant changes from where we are today, uh, with the, the triple B minus table, but, but overall, very you know, really positive in terms of their outlook. Okay, great. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Our next question comes from the line of Andrew Kusk with Credit Suisse. Thank you. Good morning. I guess it's a big, broad question where we've got a, an environment where egress is improving across the product spectrum out of Western Canada. Uh, commodity prices have clearly improved. Volumes have improved across the board for producers. So when you start to think about the environment on a go forward basis, how does your risk management activities either stay the same or change and evolve and adapt to the market that we see now? Yeah, overall, I mean, you know, we, we want to remain disciplined, um, Andrew, and we know that there's um, always a risk of, of price shock. So, you know, we want to, we definitely want to generate upside returns, but we also want to protect our downside too. And obviously, no one predicted uh, the pandemic last year. And um, who knows, there could be further waves. OPEC could, you know, maybe not be as aligned as they are today. Other factors could happen. So we're just trying to be very responsible to our, our shareholders. Um, so, you know, when we look forward, if we see sort of um, point prices that we can lock in better than sort of five-year averages, um, you know, we, we start to take advantage and, and layer in some of that, recognizing that prices could go even higher. Um, but, but again, it's just securing that base. Okay, that, 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 that's helpful context. And then just maybe a, a bit of discussion on what you view as being more captive volumes or committed volumes across your portfolio versus areas where you have maybe a bit more of a competitive dynamic. Uh, you mean you're asking like a, a percentage or a uh, rough percentage, percentage or whatever way you'd like to like to characterize it? You know, I, I mean, I, I think from a from a GMP perspective, I mean, I don't have the exact numbers. Um, generally, in the north, in our north facilities where we've made new investments, particularly at Wapiti and um, and uh, also at Pipestone, I mean, it's, it's contracted. So, um, you know, we do have. Um, you know, some of our producers that are, are producing above their initial commitments, which is always nice to see. And as we said earlier, there are um, other players in the area that we're talking to that you know, could be contracted volumes as well. 
in the south, um, they're more typically on a on an evergreen basis. I mean, we do we have been locking up more for longer terms, generally less than five years. Um, but um, you know, once they're captive to your system in a lot of circumstances, not always though. Um, uh, you know, as long as we're competitively priced, um, basically the bonds are pretty sticky. So I know those are just general comments. Um, you know, we could we could follow up with maybe a bit more specifics uh, after this call if, if it's important to us. Well, that's helpful. And maybe one final one, if I can just sneak it in, and uh, you know, along the lines of just egress improving. You know, what are your thoughts on just baseline expansion with you know line of sight on Trans Mountain? Yeah, Andrew, great question. Um, you know, we're we're talking and and we're not the operator of baseline, um, um, but you know we're we're very connected with the operators of, of baseline, and obviously we we through our condensate um, system we we have all the major players. Um, uh, as customers, so we have great relationships with them, and we we look to bring those relationships to to our 50% ownership in baseline. Um, you know, baseline is in our mind going to have great connectivity to Trans Mountain, and as a result, we see that there's no reason for us not to benefit off of PMX um, and and the, the expectation of additional storage requirements off of that system. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. I'd also mention that our baseline terminal, I mean, we, we can add a, another uh, just under 2 million barrels of capacity, about 1.8 million barrels of capacity. And that capacity is going to, it's a lot lower cost than the original phase. And that's because all the um, all the infrastructure, like the flanges and the pipe racks and uh, bridges and things like that are already in place. So um, we think that we can be very competitive as demand increases with uh, Transmount Pipeline. That's great. If you would Thanks like to ask a, if you would like to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad. And your next question comes from Robert Kwan with RBC Capital Markets. Um, I can start with the GNP segment in the South region, uh, specifically your guidance of moving utilization from below 50% to roughly 70% by mid-22. Just as time has progressed. Um, You've done some of the work, and the basin recovery continues. Like, how much of that move up in utilization do you think will just be consolidating from your existing plants versus volumes you think will be produced or be migrating from from competitor plants? Be careful. How much of that is is locked in from your view? Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. A lot of it is just by putting, you know, redirecting, um, you know, volumes from uh, the facilities that we're going to be suspending. To our most efficient facilities. Um, now, having said that, um, last year where we had basically three quarters of virtually no drilling, um, you know, obviously volume fell off uh, more than our original ex expectation. The great thing is, is that you know we've seen that volume base sort of stabilize, and producers are are starting to drill. So you know, the lost volumes we expect to um, you know to, to recover that. In the next uh, you know year or two, as as producers uh, resume drilling, um, you know, so I'll, I'll look at a a player like Spartan, who's one of the more active players in the south. Uh, one of the taglines on the um, on the release uh, from a re research report was their Spirit River wells are paying up in less than six months, and that's not surprising to me based on um, you know current commodity prices. And, and the other thing is is that we've we've helped economics a lot with our with our um, optimization program and the competitive fees that we offer to our customers, it's really going to incent them to drill. So, um, you know, we're just seeing a little bit of that in the first quarter. Again, producers are strengthening their balance sheet, but uh, I'm, I'm really interested to see what happens in the fall here and into 2022. It sounds like, though, the vast majority then of that move from 50 to 70 is. I don't want to say it's locked in, but highly confident just in moving moving the molecules around. Yeah, a lot of it is, yeah. Yeah. And again, we have to make up now for the declines from last year. Right. Um, if I can go come back to caps in contracting and recognizing you don't want to be too granular as to where these 
additional contracts or volumes are going to come from. Um, but based on your answer, are you expecting anything to come off of Northeast BC Connector, or do you think that's really just gravy and could actually underpin an expansion? You think there's enough stuff on the Alberta side to, to get you to contracting? We we think that there's enough volumes on the uh, on the Alberta side, but again, I mean, when we look at our projections, we're just taking a risk view of the basin and what's likely to happen. So um, it, it could come from Alberta, but uh, it would certainly enhance the project if um, if uh, you know we're able to capture volumes from uh, from, B, from the Alberta BC border from a, a connecting system there. Again, our system is just the Alberta based uh, solution. Right, understood. Um, and maybe just to finish then, uh, turning to marketing, and specifically for Wild Horse, have you hedged out uh, any of that in the second half or just as a new facility, are you leaving it open to make sure it runs smoothly up from an operational perspective to give you confidence to deliver product in the future? Yeah, yeah Robert, um, no, I can verify we haven't hedged anything out of Wild Horse. And, and just to remind everybody that, that the value of Wild Horse, the, the, the players that are, are leasing capacity out of Wild Horse um, are, are, are more traders and blenders, right? So if there's Contango in the market, which there isn't right now, um, they, um, they, you know, they certainly that would be within their um, toolbox to, to be able to realize value. Um, but traditionally, um, you know, that, that uh, terminal would turn products um, a monthly and it would be as a result of, of blending activities um, um, that that is the, the the way people make money out of crushing that's great thank you and your next question comes from one of Elias Foscolos with Industrial Alliance uh, good morning and thanks for taking my uh, call um, a little bit of a follow-up, I guess, on Rob's question. I wanted to maybe dive into the, the GP segment. Um, we do have, or you've printed, you know, an improvement in op, uh, operating margin, improvement of 20 to 30 million run rate uh, in the future. Um, I'm wondering, uh, although you've sort of printed the number, how do you feel about that um, as you, you know, are, are partway, more than partway through it, do you think that might be trending um, towards the uh, the upper end, middle end, and, and would you give an update at some point? Thanks, Elias, for the question. Um, you know, so far everything is trending according to plan, as we said earlier. You know, we are starting to see the benefits as these plants have uh, started to shut down and we're consolidating volume, and those operating costs are coming out of our system. So, you know, we really expect to see the majority of that benefit by the end of the year. Um, and, and to be well within that range. Yeah, I, I think we're. we're and, and, uh, Elias, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I, I think we're probably going to be more towards the lower end of the range. And some of that is, is because um, some of our optimization work is going to be done in 2022. So that, you know, that savings is going to be ongoing. The other thing I'll mention is when we refer to that reduction, it's, it's with controllable costs. So as you heard from Brad earlier, you know, obviously things like power, there's only so much we can mitigate uh, exposure to rise, rising costs. So um, it's just mainly our controllables that we're addressing. Great. Yeah, thanks for that uh, color, uh, Dean. Um, you know, I understand increased volumes potentially and, and all sort of offsets like, like power, but, um, uh, you know, I was simply trying to use calibration points off the number of plants that are shut down and being the analyst, being very high level, using that as sort of a ratio. But, but I appreciate the color, and that's it for me. At this time, there are no further questions. Do you have any closing remarks? This, uh, this is Dan Cuthbertson, and just uh, thank you all again uh, for joining us today. Feel free to reach out to the investor relations team if uh, anyone has additional um, uh, questions or contacts that they're seeking. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for participating. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.